so um, this was the one topic that I thought really needed to be covered in the file system section that's not specific to the file system assignment uh, because it's becoming increasingly common that people actually will use some kind of file system journaling and I thought well if you're taking an operating system class you really should be familiar with the concept so we'll go ahead and go through that today basically <clears throat> we have a number of competing design goals or requirements if you will in the file system design so we have the fact that these storage devices are really slow and so the operating system solves this by keeping a cache of file system data in memory which is great. That's going to make it a whole lot faster because, again, you know, when we look at the CS24 memory hierarchy and we say that, you know, yes, S, you know, what is it? L1 cache is like a few clocks away from the CPU and L2 cache is maybe a few tens of clocks and then L3 will be maybe 40 or 50 clocks away. And then we get to DRAM and DRAM is so crazy slow. It's like 100 clocks away. And then we get to the disk and it's like, 10 million clocks away and we say ah okay well caching at that level is going to produce a really substantial performance improvement so we're really happy to do this um, but the issue is that operating systems crash and I mean I, I'm sure that all of yours have crashed a little bit so far <laughs> right and uh, <clears throat> the other thing too is that hardware does fail and um, there's some really interesting research about that topic if you are interested. So you go and, and look in the research literature and Google, for example, has published a number of documents about what kinds of hardware failures do they see most frequently. Does anybody know what the single most common part of the computer is that fails? Hard drive is up there. Yeah, I think probably that is number one, but there's another one that's also really common. Power supply, yeah, power supplies suck for some reason, and they burn out. Um, but yeah, anyway, you'll see what, uh, and you know, these companies run these giant data centers, and so they get a lot of data about what fails. I suppose hard disk failures don't, uh, I don't pay as much attention to them, because typically people run RAID, and then they just sort of pull out and plop in drives, and so it's not really a serious thing. But a serious failure would be your power supply, and you do see systems now with uh, redundant power supplies and so forth. Okay, so we have a system that fails in some way, and let's pretend for a minute that it's not the hard disk that's crashing, because we're going to look at things that wouldn't otherwise by themselves cause corruption. So maybe memory fails in some way that causes the computer to flip out, or maybe the CPU explodes or something like that. So um, the other issue that we have that is a part of this is that file system operations frequently involve multiple steps. So I want to delete a file. What are all the things I have to do when I delete a file? Well, first I have to navigate to its inode. Then I have to figure out what, uh, you know, if, if nobody else is using it, then I can go ahead and remove that uh, directory entry corresponding to the file. Now I can start updating the free map to say all of these uh, entries are, or these blocks are now available for use. Frequently, operating systems manage inode pools so that... Uh, you know, that inode would then be returned to the inode pool and so forth. So there's a lot of steps you have to do to implement even a simple thing like deleting a file. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I already talked about this. Yeah, minimally it would be removing a directory entry and updating the free map, but there may be a lot of other things that you have to do. So <clears throat> if you have a situation where only one or a few of these steps actually complete, then corruption of the file system is very likely. And... Um, well, I'm going to talk about that when I get to it. I don't want to get ahead of myself because we're getting to the point where you may not have had this experience anymore, but I certainly had it a lot, so we'll talk about that. Um, but basically, the OS is responsible for making sure the file system stays correct, at least, like I say here, in some minimal way. So we want to at least make sure that we're not leaking data left, right, and center, that we have directory entries that point out into nowhere, or files that get lost from directories, or things like that. We need to make sure that the file system stays complete in some way, that we can actually access everything. So ext2, since we've been talking about ext2, <clears throat> it has a mount state value that's in the super block on the disk. The super block is just sort of the starting point. It's just like the elf header that says this is all the stuff in the elf file. The super block says this is all the stuff on the ext2 partition. 
And so that mount state value has various things it can be set to indicating the state of the file system on that drive. <clears throat> and when you unmount the drive, which we haven't really talked about mounting and unmounting, that's probably another thing I should include next year, but uh, that uh, state of the device is set to ext2 valid fs. Okay, so that means that everything finished, I flushed all my buffers, as far as I know the file system is in a valid clean state, so I can go ahead and trust that. Now when the OS starts up it looks at that status value, the mount state value for the device, and if the device doesn't say it's valid, then it says okay, something bad happened. So that's basically the way that th these things work. You can imagine, I mean, I talk about this a lot in CS122, but imagine you're the operating system and all of a sudden you black out and when you wake up, all you have is the information around you. So if you're writing a little post-it note that says, this is the last thing I did, I cleaned up my room or whatever, and you put that post-it note there, then you would, when you woke up from your blackout, you would say, okay, I did that. And it's the same thing with the OS. The OS says, I cleanly unmounted this device, so everything is fine. Or it will see, this is in some unclean state, so I need to take some steps to verify the file system. And so that's where FSCK comes in, <clears throat> which I guess Dennis Ritchie um, just recently said it didn't used to be spelled FSCK. There was one letter different. Um, but a lot of people pronounce it FSUCK or <laughs> other clever pronunciation, maybe not so clever. But anyway, the, um, when you have a, a, a file system consistency check kick off, that's a sign that you're sad because something seriously bad happened. Now, this is where I wanted to ask. Has anybody ever actually experienced an FSCK? You have? Okay, so like in what context, if I may be so bold? I didn't actually power my time. Oh, okay. So, okay, is that uh, actually, was it running ext2 or was it some other file system? Okay, yeah, and so that's the interesting thing now. Most Linux systems will use ext3 or ext4, which have things that mitigate the need for FSCKs. But ext2 didn't, and so frequently when your system would crash, say you're tinkering on the kernel, or you're just trying to configure it properly so that it will run your system more efficiently, and the system falls over, you have a, a buggy device driver or something like that, FSCK kicks off, and now you have to wait for the operating system to restore the file system to something valid. Now, what does it do? Well, it's exhaustive and exhausting, in fact, to enumerate it. So um, these are the things that ext2 requires, for example. <clears throat> Has to go through all the inodes and make sure that the number of blocks the inodes reference matches the length of the file that the inode says that it represents. Okay, so that's one thing that has to be done. Another one is that it has to make sure that all the directory entries reference valid in-use inodes, and of course that all valid in-use inodes are referenced by directory entries. This is facilitated by having an inode pool, so you know which things are inodes on the system. You have to make sure that all the directory entries are reachable from the root. Okay, so that's fun. So you go through all your directory inodes and say, can I reach each one from the root? So you have to do that kind of thing. Next thing you have to do is make sure that all the reference counts saying, this is how many links I have to this inode actually corresponds to the state of the directory structure. Maybe you lost a directory entry somewhere in some read, or not read, who cares about reads, write that you attempted and the system crashed in the middle of it and now your reference count is invalid. So you have to go through and do that. Then you have to actually go through and make sure that all the blocks referenced by inodes are reflected in the free map and vice versa. Okay, that's tedious. <clears throat> and of course, FSCK tries to do its best to resolve these issues. And again, you may or may not have seen situations like this in the past. Again, it's probably more and more distant in the past that you may have seen this. I found an orphaned inode. I'm going to go put it in this directory lost and found so that you can look at it and see if it's important or you can delete it. Or, uh, you know, I'm updating references on or reference counts on inodes because they're not correct. Things like that. Okay, that's what the file system consistency check does. Now, that's a lot of steps. <clears throat> I have something similar for the NanoDB B tree data structure that I implemented. And it goes through like five different stages where it like makes sure all the leaves are linked together properly, 
all the leaves are referenced by some non-leaf, by only one non-leaf, and blah, blah, blah. So you can go through those kinds of checks. It's pretty exhaustive, especially since this is all basically I.O. driven. And as storage devices have grown, we have a problem that, well, we have to do these exhaustive checks, and the drive is growing, the amount of data people is storing, uh, people is storing, people be storing, is growing as well, and so these file system consistency checks start taking hours to complete. And seriously, I've sat through FSCKs that took a half hour and longer because they were just tedious. So basically people said we need to find a way of improving the robustness of our file systems without having to spend so much time on verification when we run into situations. Okay. Now the solution, the, the most widespread solution is actually some kind of journal. Okay. And so when we want to modify file system data structures, and what I mean by that term is the data structures that say where files are, where directories are, what files are referenced by what, all of those things. When we want to modify any of that information, we have to record it in the journal. And so when the system crashes, now we just go look at the journal. What were we doing when the system crashed? Okay. And so the premise is that most of the time the system is going to be in a valid state, but there may be some things that I didn't finish doing when the crash occurred. And so instead of having to look at all of the state, every part of the file system, now I just look at the stuff that I was trying to change when the crash occurred. So you can see how that would be a much better thing. Instead of looking at all the data, I'd start looking at a delta instead. And journal recovery is way faster. So that, I mean, it's the same thing with Windows, uh, where again, I don't know if you've had this experience, but if you have a Windows operating system fall over and you restart it, and it's like, oh man, I gotta check the disk, and it takes, you know, maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes to go through and verify that everything is valid, it doesn't need to do that anymore because Windows NTFS also does journaling now. Okay? So journal recovery is much, much faster. Almost to the point where you're like, are you sure it's correct? Because that was really fast. <clears throat> Okay, so um, there are operations that need to be performed atomically, okay, and all that we mean when we say it's atomic is that either all the operations are reflected on the disk or none of them are, so it's something like that. And you'll notice that these generally correspond to system calls. Open, who really cares? Read, nobody really cares. Write, people care about, because it may uh, extend. Uh, if I set the file size, then that may involve a, uh, an extension or a truncation. People care about that. Um, moving a file, those kinds of things, unlinking a file. All of those things touch metadata and possibly data as well. And there may be multiple lower level operations we want to uh, include in that atomic operation. So the journal basically keeps track of transactions, and I'm going to use this term somewhat loosely until we get into the actual EXT3 discussion. Um, but the transaction either includes one atomic operation with multiple steps, or it could also include multiple atomic operations depending on the design of the file system. We'll, we'll talk about why we would want multiple atomic operations in a second. And the number one thing that I would say is that this is nowhere near as sophisticated as database transactions. Your file system has a very specific task, a very specific goal. It's trying to keep the, the data structure of the file system, which is a big complicated graph, it's trying to keep that whole thing valid. And so it really doesn't need all the various ACID properties. It may need uh, to maintain consistency, but that's really easy because there typically is only one active transaction against the file system at any given time. Okay, so that's super simple. Uh, we really only care about atomicity and to some extent durability, but you're doing this to a uh, persistent storage device, so durability is kind of like, duh, you know. So uh, atomicity is the primary goal that we have here. <clears throat> so the file system journal typically occupies a specific region of the drive that is set aside for journaling tasks, and it's typically a circular queue. So you have something that says this is the head of the journal, this is the tail of the journal, and when you log, you put stuff on the tail, and as things are completed, you can move the head forward. Or you can switch the definition of the head and tail, who cares? But uh, anyway, it's just a circular queue. Because you expect that you're never going to have just like a really arbitrarily large number of transactions. You always want the number of transactions you have to keep around to be relatively small, because then 
that's all that really needs to be applied to the file system. So what should be logged in a journal transaction? That's the interesting question here because it turns out that there's about three popular answers to this question. What should actually be logged in a journal transaction? So <clears throat> one of the most common answers, especially early on, was let's only log metadata changes. Okay? So if I want to change inode contents or I want to change, maybe I want to change an indirect block to point to other things, that would be considered metadata. Uh, I want to modify the free space map to allocate space for a file. I want to change a directory to point to some new file or I want to create a hard link, something like that. Those are examples of metadata changes that we would want to log. But there's something notably absent here as well, that data changes to the actual data in files is not journaled. Okay? And I say here that this is mostly okay. Um, it's not always okay, but it's interesting that it's actually typically mostly okay. <clears throat> So what does this mean? If we only log metadata changes, then basically what the file system is doing is exactly what we said before. We're protecting the file system. <laughs> now, if an individual file or a couple of files get it in the head, so they get corrupted because the system crashed, we really don't care because our goal is not to preserve individual files. Our goal is to actually preserve the file system structure itself. Seems kind of selfish, I think, you know, to say that, all we really care about is the file system, file data, who cares? That's the application's problem. <laughs> the user should have been backing things up. It's their fault. You know, things like that. So, uh, but yeah, currently the uh, most common answer to this question of what should be in a journal transaction is not file data changes. <clears throat> now, the reason why we might end up with corruption is that... Rights to data and metadata may be interleaved in the sequence of operations being performed against the file system. Okay? And so you definitely can have situations where um, metadata changes hit the disk before data changes do, or vice versa. And so if you have a crash that occurs between one of those things and the other of those things, you might have a situation where you end up with a particular file being corrupted. And since we're only logging metadata changes, well, again, the file system structure stays fine, but an individual file can become corrupt. So <clears throat> the primary scenario where this can occur is actually in file extension. Okay? There's a lot of other situations in which you could have this kind of thing occur, like writes into the middle of a file, something like that. That doesn't touch metadata. We don't really care about it, but since we don't log it, it's possible that you could perform a write and then the system falls over and you lose your write. Not as serious a thing, probably for, uh, well, it's definitely not serious for the file system, but it may be more serious for an application or a user who was writing code for CS124 or something like that. So anyway, uh, like I say here, the uh, file extension scenario is I have to extend the file. I have to allocate space from the free space map. I need to update inode structures and so forth. But I also need to write data, possibly past the end of the file. So if the metadata was updated to indicate that the file was extended, but I didn't get around to actually storing the data itself, now the file looks corrupt. Now it's conceivable that this could also happen with truncation, but most of the time truncation only involves metadata changes. So people looked at this and said, you know what? We could actually solve this problem of file corruption in file extension scenarios by just imposing a simple ordering rule. Simple. It uh, actually significantly complicates the uh, file system implementation, but hey, it's simple to state. Okay, so all data changes must be written to disk before any metadata changes are logged to the journal. Okay, now you're still not logging data changes, but you're just saying that all the data changes have to complete before you log any metadata changes. This is really focused on file extension because that's the sort of the main scenario where you have both of those things that have to be written. So what you're saying is you write to the sectors that you're going to add to the, the file, and then you update the file metadata to say these sectors are now in this file. Okay. And so the idea is that if you have a crash and a recovery and you restore that metadata, the data that's being pointed to is already on the disk. <clears throat> 
And since file extension is an extremely common operation, in fact, <laughs> things like database write-ahead logs only do file extension pretty much, it's kind of a really good idea to make sure that you uh, make that pretty robust if you can. Okay. Now, the, uh, the obvious overhead is now you need to keep more stuff in memory. You can't write it right away because it may be that you have to avoid writing it to follow this rule. Okay. I want to write journal records to the, the file system journal, but I'm not allowed to because I have to make sure that data updates happen first. So you go ahead and do that, and then you can go ahead and write out the, uh, the journal records. Okay, so that's the sort of the expense of this, but it's not too expensive actually. Okay. So those are two of the options. The third option is that the file system could actually log anything that happens to the journal. Okay, so now I'm actually logging data changes as well as metadata changes. And like I say here, it's a very significant space and time overhead because basically you're writing all of the data twice now. You write it to the journal, and you also write it to the file to actually apply what the journal states. Okay? But it is an absolutely solid way to make sure that the file system does not become corrupt, even in the face of crashes during operations that involve both data and metadata changes. Okay? And the neat thing is that the uh, more recent file system implementations actually support multiple of these levels of operation. So original ones like the IBM JFS journal file system, big shock, it, it's a journal file system, uh, only logged metadata, but ext3 and riserfs is another example. They all support multiple levels of journaling. So you have write back, which only records the metadata changes. No ordering rule is applied. Then you have the ordered mode, which still only writes metadata, but it follows this data before metadata rule to make sure that, uh, especially in extension scenarios, that you won't suffer file corruption very often. Okay, And so like I say, this is the default of ext3, ext4. So if you set up a new Linux system, this is what you get automatically. And then the final one is journal mode, where it actually writes all data changes as well as metadata changes. Obviously, significantly slower, but... Uh, significantly more reliable as well. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so that's the overview of journaling. Um, the way that these things typically fall out is that uh, atomic operations correspond to system calls. And I don't know if any of you have used strace. Anybody here used strace? Very much? Okay, like, for what? The shell project, yes. I think a few teams had to use Ester. I suggested that people use strace to see what the hell was actually going on. Um, strace is really nice because it tells you exactly what system calls are, are happening in a program. And I tell you, if you run strace on something like Postgres or you know a web browser or something like that, you're going to see an insane number of operations being performed. And so you have a lot of atomic operations. And if you sort of made every atomic operation, a transaction, you would start to note you'd have an, a huge number of transactions that you have to deal with. Okay, so an atomic operation typically is uh, comprised of several writes to the file system. This was an example for appending. I don't know, maybe I should have a slide where I talk about a bunch of these earlier on. But you uh, modify the free space map, allocate new uh, data blocks, you update the inode index, possibly including indirect blocks, so you might have multiple things to touch to reference the new data blocks. You write the data into the new, new data blocks. Maybe you do that third step second instead of first. Who knows? Um, I mean, sorry, instead of third. And then the uh, final one, update the files, inode metadata with the new file size and modification time. That would be an example of the steps that have to occur. And we want to make sure all of these things occur or none of them occur. Okay. And of course, depending on if we have an ordering rule we want to follow, maybe we are okay with writing the data to the new data blocks, and then all the metadata changes would happen later. Just really depends. So since we will have a very large number of them, and typically with transactions, we don't talk about this very much in this class, but in CS122 we kind of beat it to death, that uh, if you want to make sure that a write to disk 
that's really critical actually gets to the disk, you typically have to sync it so that you can make sure it gets flushed out of operating system buffers, out of disk controller buffers, actually onto the platter. And syncs typically take time. And so if I have a lot of small transactions and I have to do a sync at the end of each one to make sure it's actually recorded to disk, that's going to be slow. So typically Linux will group a bunch of atomic operations together into a single transaction. And so the transaction, again, you know, this is actually the same as what we talked about earlier on in the lecture. Uh, the entire transaction is what is going to be applied atomically. Either all of those atomic operations are applied or none of the atomic operations are applied. And you could see, wow, that could be quite a bit of work that we throw away, but that's just the way that uh, file system journaling has been implemented, uh, at least in these uh, more modern file systems. Okay, now we only need one active transaction at a time. Who's the client of the transaction component? It's really the operating system interacting with these journal devices. So um, this is why we don't need any concurrency control or anything, because we only have one of them. Okay? And once the transaction completes, then we start another transaction. So we never have any overlap of transactions. It makes it pretty simple to implement this stuff. Okay, so active. This is kind of important. I don't have a diagram of it, but I wanted to make sure that uh, we went through these various states. So we have an active transaction to which we can add things that atomic operations are doing. Okay, so I start an atomic operation, I say I'm touching this metadata, that metadata, this other metadata, we log all those things into the current active transaction. Now at some point, I can no longer add stuff to the current atomic transaction. And, um, atomic trans yeah, the, the current transaction. And so that typically will be one of two things that causes it. Either I don't have any more room for atomic operations in the transaction, so the journal fills up, which can happen, or a fixed amount of time goes by. And typically on these systems, it's five seconds. Again, I don't know if any of you have ever noticed. Um, I like watching flashing lights, I guess. But uh, Windows, if you install Windows on a, uh, on a computer and you have a little hard disk light, you know, sometimes you'll notice it blinks like once a second. So it's doing file system journaling. So anyway, but you have situations like that where basically either a certain amount of time passes or the journal doesn't have any room for more atomic operations. So at that point, that transaction becomes locked. New atomic operations have to go into the next transaction. Okay? Now what happens? This transaction is locked, but it may be that all the journal records are still in memory. We haven't actually gotten all of the parts of it onto the disk. Okay, but what we're saying is we can't add any more to this transaction. Okay, so like I say here, uh, there may be a lot of things we still have to do. Okay. We'll get to that next. So, <clears throat> let's say that I am now locked and I am writing logs to the disk, and that may actually happen when I'm still active, but uh, let's say that I'm in the locked state, but I haven't actually gotten all of the records into the journal on the disk, then I'm in the flush state. So I'm flushing all my log entries out to disk. Now obviously, um, if I've entered the flush state and I'm in ordered mode, then I have to make sure I've already written out all the data. So that's why I may go from locked to flush. It may take some time to do that if I'm trying to follow some ordering rule. Okay? Um, and like I say here, a crash during this state means the transaction will be aborted during recovery. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second too. Once all the logs are written to the disk, then I know that they are preserved. I don't have to worry, at least presuming that the drive itself doesn't fail, and we're kind of ignoring that today. So um, all the logs are on the disk, so now the transaction is actually committed. And in this scenario, if the system crashes now, I have to make sure that these operations in the transaction actually get written to the file system. Okay? Because like I said, the actual file system changes may not have been completed. So I keep going ahead, the, the operating system is doing a lot in the background, as you all know now. So I continue writing the changes that are specified in the logs to the file system. And once the file system is synchronized with that log, that transaction, then the transaction changes to the finished state. Okay. Do I need to keep the transaction around after it's hit the finished state? 
it should be pretty obvious that I don't need finished transactions because the whole idea of having a transaction is to say this stuff happened, but I don't have the file system updated yet. So once I hit finished, I don't need this transaction anymore. I can throw it away. So that's where the circular queue, the uh, tail of the circular queue would be like, okay, I've done that, so I can go ahead and move up the tail to throw away a particular transaction once it's finished. Okay, any questions about this? This is the basic idea behind how the ext3 file system journal works. <clears throat> now, recovery is really interesting because ext3 basically says, I only care about transactions that are in the commit state, which is weird, but that's what it says. We'll talk about why in a second. So obviously if it's in the finished state, the file system already reflects the changes of the transaction, so I can ignore it. If it's in the commit state, I have my logs are complete, but the file system may not have all the changes reflected in the log. Now it's possible that I did complete all those changes and then the system crashed right before I got to set the transaction from commit to finished. So in that, in that situation, I have to go ahead and reapply them because I don't know. All I have is the information I wrote down. Any other transaction that has not yet reached the commit state is incomplete. And so the file system just ignores that transaction. Like you see here, the journal may not actually contain all the parts of all the atomic operations that are supposed to be in that transaction. If I don't have all of the changes made, I can't apply them. So I have to throw it away. Now you notice something a little bit weird here that I'm saying the file system recovery mechanism just throws those incomplete transactions away. Um, in database systems, we do something slightly different. I don't know if anybody notices the difference here. Does anybody notice the difference here between file system recovery and database recovery? This is basically only a redo mechanism. We have no undo mechanism as we have specified it so far. Databases almost always need undo, redo processing to roll back transactions. Okay? So that's a major difference between file system recovery and database recovery. So for this to work, we have to follow another rule. And there has to be another rule that we follow when we write things out, that I cannot make any changes to the file system metadata until the journal on disk reflects all of those changes. Okay. And uh, actually, this rule is still not, um, yeah, I guess that's strong enough, the way I stated it. It's just a little bit ambiguous. So no changes may be made to the file system metadata itself until the journal on disk actually contains the entire committed transaction. If I follow that rule, I don't need any undo processing. But if I allow any changes to the file system, I think I actually say this next. If I make any changes to the file system that are in an uncommitted transaction, so it's in the flush state, or it's in the lock state, or it's in the active state, if I make any changes to the file system, I still don't know that that transaction is going to complete. And if I don't know it's going to complete, then the system could crash, and then I'd have to roll back the changes I made to the file system. Everybody see that? That's kind of a really key thing. And when you design these kinds of transaction processing systems, you need to think very carefully about the order of the operations here to make sure that you end up with a valid system. So all that we're saying here is that ext3 has this requirement. No file system changes until the transaction is actually committed. If I do that, then recovery becomes really simple. I only have to do uh, redo processing, no undo processing. Okay? And like I say here in the final little note, this is simply an ext3, ext4 design choice. It's not that undo processing is bad, because databases do it all the time. It's just that the design was simplified to uh, not require this. Okay? Any questions? Kind of a key thing here. All right. If you uh, don't care to think about it at that level, that's fine. But if you do, then I wanted to make sure that that point was spelled out for you very clearly. Okay, um, limitations. Well, not many. It actually is a very effective mechanism. It's been around for quite a long time now. And uh, it's 
uh, quite capable. It's been demonstrated to be quite capable. It, so even though I say here it's not nearly as sophisticated as database transaction logging, who's comparing? It's fine. It works great for what it needs to be done. Okay. Uh, there's just a few goals that it's trying to achieve, and that's, again, maintaining the integrity of the file system, all the data structures, and uh, also trying to do that while also avoiding these expensive consistency checks. That's the thing that I really want to avoid. Okay, and I already talked about this. I just talked about this on a slide ago. So um, database system recovery, typically much more sophisticated because it has much more ambitious goals. Um, but file systems have very simple goals, and so the recovery processing is pretty simple. Okay, okay so uh, I'm not going to spend any more time talking about that because I feel like I kind of beat that one to death. Now, interestingly, journaling file systems have an obvious benefit and a subtle benefit, a much less obvious benefit. The obvious benefit is that now my, my system is much more robust. If it falls over, not, a, not such a big deal. Okay? I used to really freak out when Windows would crash because it may mean that, ah, oh, great, now I'm going to have to reinstall it because some critical thing got mangled. Now it's not such a big deal. Same thing with Linux, although Linux was already a little bit more reliable than Windows back in the day. So that's an obvious benefit, but there's a really interesting non-obvious benefit, which is that this journaling approach greatly improves I.O. performance. Who would have thought? But that's actually a big benefit. Does anybody know why that would be? Okay, let's... let's Stick to magnetic disks, which I think all of you understand pretty well. Um, are magnetic disks good at random access? No, they don't like it very much. Why don't they like it? I mean, they don't care really, but human beings using them don't like it. Because I'm moving this giant arm. I mean, I'm talking about the perspective of an ant sitting on the platter, but I have this giant arm that has to slew back and forth. If I only have to slew a little bit, then I may have a slew time of... Um, you know, a tenth of a millisecond, something like that. But if I have to slew all the way across, I may have a three to six millisecond penalty. Okay, so that is pretty lame. So is my journal, you know, it's a circular queue. Is that going to be accessed randomly or sequentially? It's primarily sequentially. I'm writing to it, I'm reading from it, I'm writing to it. Sequential. So that's one thing that's fast. Yay, small seeks, right? The other thing that's interesting about this is remember that if I'm following these rules and I'm saying I have to write all this data out, I have to write the journal records and then I can start writing metadata out, I need to write data first, well, the OS can frequently take those writes and order them in a way that minimizes seeks. So suddenly, because I'm doing journaling and I'm batching up writes, I can order the writes so that they're much faster. And that was a really surprising and unexpected benefit of file system journaling. So that's kind of cool. That's, that's kind of a really neat little uh, result from file system journaling. Okay. Now, any questions about journaling? Okay, because what we're going to talk about next for the last, hopefully, 10 minutes is that uh, file system journaling has become a very popular approach to making systems more robust and more reliable. But uh, there's a bunch of other approaches that people have actually explored for making file systems robust. And they've actually caught on. There's a number of uh, you know, example uh, file systems that use these various approaches. First one is called soft updates. Soft updates are basically carefully considering the order of operations in my atomic operations to make sure that data never becomes corrupt. Okay, so journaling is let's add extra functionality so that people can do things in whatever order and the file system will take care of it. This is saying, hey developers, think very carefully and don't corrupt the file system. Typically the only issue you see on these systems with soft updates is that you will leak a little bit of space. Okay. And that's kind of an important detail. We're saying here that the file system thinks the space is unavailable, but it actually is available. Okay. The inverse of this situation would be a terrible disaster. The file system thinks space is available, but some file is using it. 
That would be very severe corruption. But this situation is just like garbage collection. It's like conservative GC. The worst case is, I think space is in use, but it's not. Okay, so that's the issue here. And since this is not a big deal, in the case of a crash, an OS can start resolving that issue in the background while I'm not doing any other things. Okay, what does it do? Well, it turns out that it is it is exhaustive, just like with FSCK, but I can do it in the background because it's not a critical thing that will prevent me from doing anything at all. I just scan through all the inodes, and if nobody's referring to a particular file system block, I say, oh, that should actually be free, and I take it back from being in use and make it free. Okay, so that's soft updates. Any questions about that? Yes, there are file systems that use this. <laughs> I'll talk about one, um, because there's basically only one. Um, because it turns out you have to think very carefully when you implement this. So, yeah, um, benefit, you can mount a file system immediately after a crash. You don't have any log to replay. Um, this is obviously touted by the people who use soft updates, because they say, well, um, journaling is slow. It takes, like, maybe a few seconds. And this is instant. Everybody can wait a few seconds, right? You wait a few seconds when you look at Facebook, you know. Who cares? The issue is that engineers have to be very, very clever. And I think that it's kind of been borne out that engineers are very capable of being very, very unclever. And so why would I build my entire file system on the premise that engineers will be very, very clever? Okay. Nonetheless, there is one file system that has been built that uses soft updates. Like I say here, it's called the Unix file system, UFS. Um, it's also known as FFS in BSD, but that is, uh, if, if you are curious about how the soft update mechanism works, you can go look at uh, UFS. I think Dennis Ritchie, again, is very heavily involved in the, uh, the development of uh, the Unix file system, or was. Okay, second uh, alternative, log structured file systems. So I have a file system data structure, the big thing that occupies the bulk of the drive, and then I have the journal. What if I changed this layout to saying I'm only going to keep the journal and I'm going to throw away the file system? So my journal can be much larger. How do I actually access data? Well, I actually resolve reads and writes against the journal instead of actually navigating the file system. Okay? So, yeah, like I say, the journal is still maintained, but now it's very large because it is everything. Okay? So if you have reads, you just go look for the most recent record in the journal that corresponds to that file or that directory, and that's how you actually access. You, sh you guys should be glad you don't have to do these kinds of things for the Pintos lab. Boy, that would suck. Writes, very simple. You just add something to the end of the journal to say, hey, now I have a new write that I performed. I changed a directory, uh, changed, you know, changed the name of a directory or, or an entry in a directory. I changed where a file is located. I deleted a file, things like that. The rationale, like I say here, sequential writes are much faster and easier to batch up than random writes. So this is the premise behind the log structured file system. Okay? And the other nice thing about it is if you have a point in the logs that's valid, you can say this is now a snapshot of the file system at this state. Okay? So some really clever things you can do with log structured file systems. Now we're saying that sequential writes are going to be faster. Um, do you think reads will be faster in log structured file systems than they would be in a regular file system? What do I have to do to do a read? I gotta search through the logs, right? I gotta go say, okay, where is this file's data? It's gonna be spread out through the log, so I have to go find the appropriate entry uh, in the log to resolve the read. Now recovery is nice and simple. I just find the point in time where the journal was last valid, and that is, I'm done, I'm recovered. So that's pretty fast. Um, the issue with log structured file systems is you have to figure out when can you actually reclaim journal entries. And it's pretty easy to figure out. Basically, the log is only recording writes, and so if I have multiple writes to a particular value or area of data, I just, all the earlier writes I can throw away. Okay? It's only the last write to a particular data value that I need to keep around. Now, if I'm 
keeping snapshots and so forth, that'll change this rule, but in general, I only need to keep the last write to a particular area of the file system. And it's kind of interesting because let's say you're trying to reclaim space in your log, and so you say, well, this stuff I can throw away because I have later writes, but I have data that hasn't been rewritten yet. Well, just leapfrog it, move it back to the, st the front of the journal. Okay. So this is an interesting thing. I'm not sure I like it because now you have writes that can occur in a different order or appear to have taken place in a different order than they originally did because you're moving the write log forward in the journal. But people don't seem to mind. It seems like it's been okay in the way that people have implemented log-structured file systems. Okay, so that's the premise here. Now, um, this is what I was saying before. Writes are fast because it's sequential. I'm just adding to the front of the log. Reads have generally sucked on magnetic disks because I'm starting to seek all over the place to find the data that I want. Now, can you think of a device where the device would be fine with this kind of access? Anything flash-based. We're perfectly happy doing this kind of thing. And so that's where this has actually started to really catch on. And if you look at log structured file systems and examples of them, the vast majority of them are actually for flash devices, efficient flash device usage. Okay? The reason why flash devices can't do in-place writes I can write to a block, but then I can't rewrite to that block. I have to erase it before I can rewrite, and I have to erase much larger groups of blocks. So that prevents me from doing in-place writes. But the journal doesn't do in-place writes. I put them at the front of the log. The other thing, I can only go through so many write erase cycles before the cell is exhausted and it's no longer able to be used. Again, how does the journal write? Well, I write from the beginning of the device all the way through to the end, and then I go back to the beginning and write through it again, and so forth. So you can see that log-structured file systems play really well with flash devices. I never do in-place writes, and I traverse slowly and methodically through the entire device. I'm not hammering one cell or one area of cells because data is always changing, and then in another place, uh, cells aren't changing. This log-structured file system approach wears very evenly on a flash device. Does everybody see that? That's why I'm like totally excited about this, because this is like, this is going to be cutting edge, um, because we're going to see more and more heavy usage of flash devices, and I have a feeling that eventually magnetic drives are only going to be used for, you know, really big bulk archival uh, scenarios, just like CDs and tapes are kind of becoming, or have become that way. Okay, so uh, there's a number of these log-structured file systems. One is the universal disk format, which is used for DVDs and many rewritable CDs. I don't know if, if any of you have experienced this kind of thing, but you can create a CD where you write files to it, and then you can delete a file off the CD. How in the world does that work? Do you have to rewrite the whole CD? Well, no. Actually, what it does is some kind of log-structured file system where you just say, Oh, and by the way, I deleted this file. The file data is still on there in the log, but you just wrote a subsequent log entry saying, now it's gone. <laughs> Don't show it anymore. Okay, so that's UDF. And then you have a ton of implementations for flash-based devices. So uh, you have journaling flash file system, JFFS and JFFS2. Those are, uh, like I said, Linux file systems. And then you have a whole bunch of intended replacement. Uh, LogFS... You, Ubi, fzz, I don't even know how to pronounce these, but the, my favorite one is the last one, yet another flash file system. Okay. Just like Yak is a, yet another compiler compiler. Okay, the final one, which we'll talk about really fast, is uh, copy on write. We talk about copy on write in the context of forking processes and memory management. Um, it's also very helpful for doing file systems because it allows you to avoid corruption very easily. You never modify data in place. You always make a copy and modify the copy. So the copy is not visible to the rest of the file system until you do a single atomic update that makes that copy visible. And you might say, well, what about this situation where I might have to do two things? Well, no, you just make bigger copy, and then you, again, have a single atomic update that changes from the old version to the new version. So basically, the file system is 
only ever moving from valid state to valid state to valid state with atomic operations. And a uh, crash will either come before or after that atomic operation. So you'll never see an invalid state. Okay, so that's copy on write. Last slide. Uh, here's one example of a copy on write file system developed by Oracle, B-Tree file system. Now, if you're familiar with B-Trees, they are not designed very well for copy on write, so they had to make some serious tweaks to how B-Trees work. Um, there's actually a lot of information about BTRFS or butter file system or better file system, some people say. Uh, so you can look at that if you're curious. And then there's also ZFS, which is actually um, kind of, I've seen a lot of mentions of it because ZFS was designed from the beginning to be very, very reliable. And uh, even to, um, you know, uh, what do you call it, sector decay and so forth, situations where file systems fail without you knowing about it. Um, but since Sun got acquired by Oracle, Oracle owns this one as well. So that also does copy on right. Okay, any questions? That's all I have to say about journaling. So I will, well, good luck with project six, I guess, and five if you're still working on it. <laughs>